basically, this is a, a success story about how, uh, how I use JavaScript. It's, so it's kind of like a feel-good um, success story about implementing JavaScript in a database company. So um, this company is Iris Couch. It, I co-founded it, and I'm the technical lead of this company. We basically do, uh, well, I'll show you. We do um, software as a service, database as a service. You just punch in your name in the form, and you get CouchDB. Uh, is the first thing. We also do, um, we've got sort of betas now of other databases like Redis and uh, Graphite and all these other kinds of databases. But uh, we started with CouchDB and our primary um, database is CouchDB. I'm an Apache CouchDB committer, so, uh, so it's kind of natural. And so CouchDB is Erlang, uh, uh, you may know, and it's not, well, the core of CouchDB is implemented in Erlang, but there's lots of JavaScript parts to it, and I'll kind of talk about those. But the real thing, really, that I'm talking about is Node.js, in, uh, in my opinion, so in my discussion. So the thing, we use a lot of programming languages uh, to run this, this sort of cloud database service. Uh, we've got a CDN, and we've got all sorts of advanced stuff, and there's, let's see, there's definitely Erlang. There's a bunch of uh, Ruby. There's Rake, actually. I love Rake. Um, there is, what else? There's some Python, probably some Perl. And originally, there was like no JavaScript, it, except CouchDB, which, which you do, um, you can sort of query with JavaScript. Um, but that was built into the database. And so just yesterday, I checked the code. And uh, what I discovered was all these languages that we use for various things um, Node.js now represents 90% of all of the software that we've written internally. So even though I'm a CouchDB developer and perfectly comfortable in Erlang, and Erlang's great, and uh, all these other languages are great, Node.js has just completely dominated our, just the, the volume of code that we've written. And that's really weird because like I, I, I thought, I, I don't even like JavaScript. I don't like it. It's like, it's not, I, I don't, I don't like it. I didn't like it. And so I was really surprised that I, apparently I wrote JavaScript basically for two years uh, nonstop. So let's see. So this is William James, sorry, an American philosopher from the, uh, from the 19th century. This, I love this quote. I just stumbled across it somehow. I don't remember. And he's talking about Freud and Freudian psychology. And... Apparently, at the time, I think, I don't think Freud was uh, so big, but Freudian thinking had just permeated, had just completely um, indoctrinated everybody or sort of infected all of, I guess, psych psychological thinking or something. So every question, the answer was Freud, something like that. And the real problem was uh, it started to become obvious that he was wrong. You know, now Freud is part of the history of psychology. He's not part of the practice of psychology anymore. So he was basically wrong. And this became obvious, and people were, I think, as far as I know, pretty much denying that and arguing and all of this. So he says, but the malcontents will hardly try to refute our reasonings by direct attack. It is more probable that turning their back upon them altogether, they will devote themselves to sapping and mining the region roundabout until it is a bog of logical liquefaction into the midst of which all definite conclusions of any sort may be trusted ere long to sink and disappear. Um, a bog of logical liquefaction. I think that's the coolest thing I've ever heard of. Um, and... This is 1890. I think it basically also describes modern discourse on the internet today. Uh, this is how most people talk about most things on the internet, in my opinion. Um, like Twitter, all of this sort of stupid conversation about stupid things. Um, about We're talking about serious subject, you know, subject matter, programming, and things like that. But I think most of the conversation is uh, I would call stupid. And it's this bog uh, is, is kind of how I feel. So I think that that is why I did not like JavaScript at the beginning is I just kind of heard, maybe I used it a long time ago or something, and I heard uh, 
about it or something, and I knew, I knew it wasn't good, and I was, I was using Python before, so I was kind of, I don't know, I just, I think I, think I, was, I kind of fell victim to this, this superficial discussion. Um, and that's exactly, I think, the, the, the situation is that for me, um, my understanding of JavaScript was superficial. And now I think my understanding of, of a lot of things is superficial. I think that's kind of how we like to think if we're not careful. So for example, this is my, my wife, uh, Neil in the foreground, Pope John Paul II, PJP, is, uh, is there some sort of school field trip or something. And um, so for me, the reason this is up here is for, for me personally, when I, when I meet people, especially strangers, for me, like, uh, like walking in the street or like passing in the street or in the lift or something like that, I notice two things immediately when I see strangers, when I see new faces. Probably the first thing I see is gender. And the second thing I see is race. Um, it's just like, it's literally that fast. And so I think that's, that's normal. But the point is, that's not really useful information about anything. If you were doing a job interview or something like that, race and gender are the least significant factors. In fact, if you're thinking about race and gender at a job interview, you're, that's, that's worse than nothing, you know? That's like counterproductive. Um, but it's just the first thing that I always see. I think it's the first thing I see for everything is the, just the superficial characteristics of, of anything. And what I noticed uh, recently, I think I came home one day, I, I was talking to my wife or something, and I noticed that, I mean, this was, we've been married uh, uh, six years, and we dated and stuff. So, I mean, it's, it's been years. So now I see this face, and it's just this person who I've known. I don't see really anything superficial anymore. As soon as I see my wife's face, I, f I see um, just all these emotions come up that come from the history of our relationship, uh, basically the current status and the entire history of our relationship and what's been going on and you know how that's been going and so forth. So if I see her, either I miss her or I'm, or I'm angry or like whatever the emotion is, it's not superficial anymore. It's this, it's this uh, substantive thing. And that applies for everyone. Um, when I first met her dad, I thought, Chinese man, right? Actually, right. So that's what I saw. I saw it's a guy and he's Chinese. That's all I know. He's actually sort of not Chinese, and so I was wrong. Um, he grew up in Chinatown in Thailand, so he's part of the diaspora. So is that Chinese? Yes, no, doesn't matter, you know? Um, it's funny, the guy grew up his entire life, he lives in Thailand, he like can't speak Thai very well. Like my Thai is better than his Thai, it's hilarious. He's got this like thick Chinese accent, it's so funny. And, um, so now, after many years, I see my father-in-law. It's the same thing. There's a lot of sort of feelings and emotions and things that come into play. In fact, um, just, just this morning, actually, I just got an email uh, from my wife. He came back from the hospital, got prostate cancer. To, like, just this morning, I got this, 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 this message. So, so now there's, there's this new, you know, relationship that's going to happen. And, and, and importantly, I know that it's going to terminate soon, you know, at least in the... In the in the timeline of, of, for, of my lifetime, this, this relationship is going to end soon, and the superficial characteristics of it are going to be completely pointless, completely irrelevant. And so I feel like, well, what else is superficial, you know? Um, Pope John Paul II is also dead, or he's, he's, he's dead. And I think, I don't remember when he died, but I think probably when he died, I probably said something like, whatever, you know, and then I was thinking, like, how many, s how many serious sub substantive relationships did he have? You know, one of the biggest bureaucrats in the world uh, and one of the most influential people in the world. How many um, substantive relationships did he have with people? And how many superficial relationships did he have with people? I had a very superficial relationship with John Paul II. And when he died, I probably said, like, oh, good riddance or something like that. And now I regret that, I think. Um, I think there, there's really no point in acting on superficial information. So what I'm talking about is substantial relationships. To get back to, you know, to JavaScript, I think now I've been using Node.js, and it's been I've, it's pretty much two years of writing Node.js software nonstop. 
and I feel like now I do have a relationship with JavaScript. I understand it. I no longer see the superficial kind of ugly stuff, the functions and the semicolons and things like that. Doesn't matter. That's not important. The important thing is really what I've been doing with Node.js um, and building a content distribution network and building monitoring and building high availability features and all of these things. That's the substance of, the rela of my relationship with JavaScript. And so uh, I remember actually, so I joined uh, Couch One, the, one, of the, one of the original CouchDB companies. I joined there and um, I had a job interview and Michael Rogers was uh, interviewed me he, who, was, who had already been working there. He's one of the, one of the core guys in the Node.js community. And uh, I had just been doing a lot of Python and I loved it and it was fine. And I remember I called him on the phone. We, we had a phone interview and he said, yeah, Node.js. Uh, he said, Node is awesome. I love Node. Node's great. Node's great. Node, 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 Node. What do you think about Node? And of course I said, I love Node. It's great. I love Node. And I Googled, you know, what's Node? And you can't Google Node, by the way. And he, every, everyone says Node, 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 Node. And you can't Google that. Um, so I kind of like, uh, I did what everybody does. I'd sort of bullshitted my way through, a, through an interview. And um, we ended up working together, and that's how I got into Node.js, was he was right there, and he would just kind of, kind of make recommendations or, or build prototypes or examples or something. And that sort of, uh, sort of that's, that's how I started getting back into JavaScript and using it for things. And so now I think I can say that my relationship with JavaScript is not superficial, and I don't dislike it anymore. I think now I've upgraded and now I'm, 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 I'm kind of so-so on JavaScript now. I'm so-so. I'm, I'm it's, it's okay. You know, it's okay. Um, Node.js is great. Uh, JavaScript is fine. It's cool. It's a tool. I think a good, rela a good uh, f emotion to have about a programming language is so-so. Um, if you really love it at the beginning, fine, but, but we're all carpenters, right? And what do carpenters think about hammers? You know, you need it, but it's not, it's, you know, it's just a tool. So I feel that way about JavaScript. And Node.js has been a very useful tool. The big, I guess what I would say about Node.js is uh, two things. One, every time you do I.O., you feel it. It's painful, and that's, that's good. And then the other, the other really good thing is that any time you do anything, you get this error Ob this error kind of object comes back to you if you're familiar. You write a function, first parameter, always an error. And so it reminds me of like C or, I don't know, it doesn't remind me of anything. I f you know, you're, you're always reminded to check your errors and do the right thing. And it feels like it's helping me stay disciplined with managing errors and unexpected situations and things like that. That's just really cool. It's not really JavaScript, it's just the Node.js uh, custom or something. But, so speaking of substantial, let's move into uh, a, little bit of, a little bit of how this works. Hmm. Go over here. Uh, this is a pretty simple graph of uh, like the servers, one kind of uh, data center at Iris Couch. Um, it reads left to right. Kind of clients come in, they hit servers, they go to the back end, you know, and then, and then the, the response kind of works its way back over to the left. So maybe I'll kind of I'll kind of zoom in and show you. So CouchDB is a web server only, and the only way to talk to CouchDB is through HTTP. So that's great. So we have a web client. We got a browser or something like that. Uh, starts here, right? Clients. So you you type ah foo.iriscouch.com or something like that. The first step, if you're familiar, generally speaking, is a DNS lookup. Um, since since a few months ago, our DNS server, I completely rewrote it, and it is now 100% Node.js, 100% JavaScript. Uh, we have a CDN now, and we've got multiple data centers uh, all over the place, and we've got high availability, and we've got um, replication across the internet and all of these sorts of things, and the DNS server understands all of that and can provide responses for users, and then it, it helps us on the back end. And so I just completely redid all of it in Node.js. So this is now, um, this is actually, this is named D. It's an open source uh, module, uh, NPM package that I made. The core DNS protocol and server and that sort of thing actually is identical to the HTTP server API. So if you know how to make a web server in Node.js, you can make a DNS server in Node.js. And I did that, and it's been fantastic. So anyway, the DNS server, um, let me back up just uh, 
How do I go back? One moment. I'll kind of describe this, um, my, 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 my icons. Rectangles are computers, and circles, ellipses, are processes. It's really simple. The only thing I kind of wanted to talk about is these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six hexagons are sort of uh, omnipresent. CQS is a job queue system that I wrote also in Node.js. It's, it uses CouchDB as the database, and the client is Node.js, and it is 100% ripped off from the Amazon, sorry, ripped off, that's an Americanism. It's stolen from the Amazon SQS API. So it's identical, except it uses CouchDB and it's Node.js, and it's been very, very stable, and I love it. And so this job queue is going to be in there, and I'll, I'll just kind of mention the job queue uh, coming up. And also just this general state that I've got. These are couch databases, the, uh, the hexagons. And so since CouchDB is an HTTP service, something that's very convenient is uh, basically anytime, anywhere in your software, distributed systems and all of this stuff, anytime you really need to know anything, you can just make an HTTP call to some server somewhere. And that's going to go through firewalls and that's going to work pretty, pretty easily. So it's very nice. It's very convenient to have this when you're building like an internet-wide application because any component can check a web server somewhere. And when your performance gets bad, you start replicating, and now you can check local databases and so forth. So that's been very nice. So what I'm saying is these hexagons are sort of floating in space everywhere in my diagram. Uh, it didn't look very good in, uh, what is it, GNU plot? Uh, is it GNU plot? GNU graph? Omnigraph? No. Whatever I use. GNU plot? Anyway, so clients check DNS. DNS knows the state of everything, right? Um, this state is every customer that we've got, every server that's running, every back end, every front end, whether things are up, down, uh, in an error state, you know, this sort of thing. It's a database of our facility. And so with that state known, the DNS server knows a response, an IP address to send back to the client. And you're saying, wait, you get a DNS query and you do a, CouchDB query, you do an HTTP query, that's crazy. And I would say, yeah, that's totally crazy. And this is why Node.js is cool, because in Node.js, you feel I.O. It's, it's, it's tough. Uh, it, you know you're doing I.O. when you're doing I.O. You feel it. You've got to type function, and you've got to do this, and you've got to go new line, and then close it out, and then go back up. This is how I do it. And then you, and then you get this error object, and you, you've got to handle your error object or somebody's going to complain or, or, or tease you about it or something on GitHub. And so you feel I.O. and it's really painful, and that's good because I.O. is painful, and I.O. is where problems happen, and so that's appropriate. And so a cool thing that I do in CouchDB is CouchDB can just give a, a stream of all the data in the database real time. So this DNS server, in this case, just pulls that stream down and any real-time updates, it just updates the memory. And when we get a DNS request, we just respond right through. It's very fast, no I.O., it's great. How do I know it's no I.O.? Because I didn't indent, and I didn't do any queries against the server. Um, so anyway, clients get these IP addresses. They hit these proxies. These proxies are still Erlang, actually. The original, before I learned JavaScript, I wrote these proxies. They're still up. This is really the legacy, the last thing besides CouchDB which is not JavaScript. These proxies also know the state. Um, uh, are servers up? Are they down? Sometimes we can, oversell, uh, we can oversell capacity, so we might shut people down if they're idle. And if that's true, then when a connection comes in, we have to boot that server up really quickly and then send the, send the, uh, send the request through. And so all of that is known in this state, and these proxies also know that. Um, with this response, flow kind of moves through to these workhorses, and these workhorses just run a bunch of CouchDB, basically. So workhorse to CouchDB, CouchDB back to the proxy, and then it's just kind of moving through. These proxies are just dumb TCP proxies, actually, at this point. So there the data goes back and forth, back and forth. So now, the... The cool thing, so this was the original uh, implementation, pretty much, and this was, I think, on Amazon EC, actually, I know it was on Amazon EC2, and um, it worked okay. What we sort of realized is we could just 
copy this and move it to another data center and then have exactly the same thing. Oh, and by the way, CouchDB can replicate across data centers, no problem. In fact, the, the thing that CouchDB does best, some would say the only thing it does well, is replicating. And that's so important for so many types of applications. So, so this was the big idea. Ah, same setup, new data center, other foo, other bar, Baz. So we got the same reverse proxy, same reverse, same workhorses. Now Baz actually in my, in this example, um, can be replicating, and Node.js is handling all of that replication as well, um, in in the sense of monitoring it and making sure that it's that it's up and pinging everybody and making sure that replicas are going through. Uh, CouchDB will replicate, but we've got another layer on top of that to be sure that it's happening and to know if it's failed and all of that sort of thing. And so we're, we're watching that with Node.js sort of on the outside, looking at all of the components. Now, I think probably the, the, the most well-known customer that we have is NPM, the, the Node. Actually, it's not an acronym, but it's NPM, the packaging system for Node.js. We run that. That's a CouchDB server. And we run that, and so what, we've, what we started doing is, OK, run local clusters. This diagram represents a local cluster in one data center, basically zero, points of, zero single points of failure. Right, so anything can fail, and everything still works. And we've got Node.js monitoring this, checking every possible route through the proxies and the workhorses to the back ends on this local cluster. And ah. Again, there's replication, and we've got Node.js confirming that that looks good. When NPM goes down or has any problems, it's getting, it's getting to the point now, it's pretty severe. If, if NPM must not go down anymore, really. So I think starting this year, it's really become sort of a, a, a I don't know, mission-critical service. And so this is where we went uh, with, this, with this idea. And then the next thing we did was started replicating in different data centers. In fact, since I'm in Singapore, if you want an NPM uh, endpoint here in Singapore, let me know, and I'll, I'll spin one up. Or if you want your CouchDB here, I think Amazon EC2 is in Singapore, right? Maybe SoftLayer also, anyone know? So if you, want, if you want your data and your NPM or anything copied here or replicated here, let me know, and I'll just uh, do it. It's, uh, it's fun. It's all command line stuff, but it's fun. And so the final, the final um, step that, that we did that I'm pretty excited about is we started cloning this in multiple data centers all over the place for high availability. And what we, what we really started doing is making completely isolated NPM services now. Um, in fact, I think it's up. You can go to irisnpm.com. I designed this website, and I uh, implemented the front end. And it's obvious that I'm a back end person when you see the site it's like it's bad but it's awesome and um, so the idea is now you can just uh, we can we can spin up NPM mirrors for people and private NPM mirrors for people to start publishing packages privately within their organization like 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 github pretty much the same idea and uh, so that needs to be local that needs to be inside somebody's facility or data center or whatever and this has happened somewhat with couchdb uh, of course, replicating, but like I said, the code that we've written now has been pretty much completely in uh, sorry, completely Node.js. And I think my, f I, I just realized how I feel about Node.js. Um, Node.js now feels like Perl used to. I think Perl in the 90s, if you were there, if anyone was there, Perl in the 90s was sublime. It was like, it was like acid in the 60s, you know, it was just, there was, it was, you could do no wrong, right? It was just perfect. It was the perfect time, the perfect place, everything. I mean, with, with Perl back then, you could write websites, you could write web services, you could, uh, I don't know, go through data, analyze data, make reports about things. You could do anything in Perl back then because everything was text files and text streams and a few web services. And now that's how I feel about Node.js. Everything is a web service. Everything is OAuth from here to here and there to there. Everything is a different API or even a different protocol like DNS. And I feel like I can always prototype something in 20 minutes with Node.js that 
does all of this I.O. It's really perfect at I.O. And um, you know, reaching out across the internet and accessing whatever I need to access and bringing all of that together, and it's very simple. It feels like Perl used to feel. That's really my, my assessment. So with that, that's actually wrapping it up. I think, um, I think the, the thrust that I would leave you with is that I don't know if, if Node.js is JavaScript's killer app or if JavaScript just has a renaissance or something, but now, uh, so first of all, the evidence shows that I like JavaScript, even though I don't agree with the evidence, I don't feel like I do, I must, because it's got this killer app of Node.js. Thank you. <laughs>